Hello and welcome to the next video in our Project Roscoe, a 68030 based computer build. So in this video, we're going to talk a little bit about the cache in the 68030. A couple of interesting things about how it works and a couple of effects it has on the external world that we should be aware of. So the picture here is the one from the data sheet, but I think we're going to switch over to a little drawing here because it'd be a little easier to talk through some of it while we're drawing. So we'll start with, so the 6830 has two caches. It has an instruction cache and a data cache, and they're both the same size. They're both 256 bytes in size. And they also have the boat, the same uh, sort of logical design. And so we'll draw it here, which is that, uh, the cache has 16 lines to it and each line is composed of 16 bytes and those bytes are broken up into four d words and so the cache deals at its smallest unit with d words so four bytes and so the cache thinks of everything in terms of d words so it's all 32-bit quantities and that has a minor effect in how it does external bus access that we'll look at later on but conceptually there's 16 lines and each line has these 16 bytes to it and with each line there is a a tag which is a little place where you store the rest of the address for what this line is containing and then for each of the four d words in a given line there is a little valid bit and there's you know a set of these four valid bits for each line individually and so conceptually if your sort of core cpu is trying to read uh an instruction and that instruction is at let's say zero x hex address zero one zero 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 two zero so that's the address in hex that we're trying to grab an instruction from and so keep in mind the instruction fetching mechanism always does 32-bit uh, reads from memory. So it's going to do a 32-bit read at this address, hoping to find some instruction to run. Now when it does it, the first thing it'll do is that it will look, it'll skip this first six, the first 16, or not 16, the first four bit value, one six, one hexadecimal digit, sorry, uh, which represents sort of where in a line you are. And the next hexadecimal digit represents this address will be cached in which of these 16 lines. So it's going to see a two here. And it's going to go down to the tag associated with line number two. So there's a line here for that particular tag, and it's the line number two. And it's going to take a look. And that tag, it's going to compare that tag against all the remaining parts of the address. So these upper six hexadecimal digits of address are getting compared to the tag. And if they are a match, then it knows that what is in the cache is from this particular address. And there's a second thing, which is that, as I mentioned, the each cache line has these four D words in it. And each, line, each D word has a valid bit that goes with it. And so if we're looking for a particular, we're looking for zero, so it'll be something in this first D word, it will go check to see if that valid bit is one. And if the tag matches, and the valid bit is one, then this value here is the value we want. So it's in the cache, in which case this will get returned back up to the CPU and no memory access will occur and the CPU will continue executing code. If, however, the tag does not match, then it knows it has a cache miss. And so it will then go out to real memory and grab that new D word from memory. And on its way back to sort of the core CPU, it will put the actual current address in the tag. So now the new tag will be here, the 010000. It'll put that in the tag. It'll invalidate all the D words except for the one that it was reading in. It'll put that D word back into the cache and then set the valid bit. And so basically every time the instruction reads from memory, it'll put it into the cache. And if that line is in use by a different address, it'll replace that line in the cache, effectively evict that line and start putting in this line. And that works pretty well for an instruction cache because it visualizes you have a bunch of instructions that are running. And at some point, maybe you have a jump instruction or a loop that causes it to go back up to the top. And maybe this is a loop that runs many times in a row. 
And in this case, the first time through, these instructions are all going to get pulled into the cache. But as long as this whole like subroutine is less than 256 bytes in size, then once it's in the cache the first time, it'll be in the cache for all of the subsequent execution cycles. And so as a result, an instruction cache of this size, if your, your logic ends up being less than that in size, it's a fantastic way to do it because you'll get a very, very high hit rate. Maybe it's you know greater than 90% hit rate in the cache, especially in code that does a loop like this. And so it's a very effective way, even with a relatively small cache, um, to have a high hit rate in the cache. And of course, every time the instruction is being pulled from the cache, it means the bus isn't busy grabbing that instruction. And so the bus is then available for other data accesses, like the actual work being done by the subroutine. So it's a huge advantage, and it's obvious why the 6820 had an instruction cache with no data cache, because if there was any cache to do, an instruction cache first is a great way to start. And so sure enough, the instruction cache serves that purpose of uh, having that cache for subroutines. It also means that if you're gonna write code for the 6830, it's helpful to know this because you might decide to unroll your code such that it fits within 256 bytes. Um, and if you're aware of that, then you can make a significant improvement in the execution speed of your code uh, because you can have it fit within the cache and have it have a very high cache hit rate uh, while it's executing. So that's the instruction cache, which operates as you'd expect, because the instruction caches don't have to deal with writes. So we also have the same cache over here on the data side, and it's the same architecture. It is, you know, 16 uh, cache lines, you know, and 16 bytes broken up into the four D words that make up a complete line. So that's no different. And it operates on the same concepts of it deals pretty much only with, with D words. So with a data cache, of course, you have reads and writes. Now, at, on the read side, it acts just like the instruction cache. If you go to read something and it doesn't find it in the cache, it'll go out to real memory and grab it. It'll bring it back. And along the way, it will deposit it into the cache. So everything you read ends up in the cache. If it wasn't there, it gets put in there. It's very straightforward on reads that um, it tries the cache. And then if it doesn't find it, it'll go get it and put it in the cache. And that results in pretty good overall behavior if you are iterating through an array or something. Once that's in there, if you iterate through it again, it'll be in the cache. So it's a good optimization. Um, but writes are a unique thing. And the 6830 has somewhat of an unusual thing, which is it has a configuration register in the cache control register. And it's got a little bit that you can turn on or off that sets a mode called write allocate. And it's an interesting idea in that it defaults to zero. So by default, this write allocate mode is disabled. And when you're in this mode zero with the, uh, the no write allocate, the behavior of a write is very simple. If you have an address you're writing to, and we can assume for a minute we're writing to this, let's say we're writing to the same address, it will go look you know, at the right spot to look at the tag and see if there is a hit. And if there is a hit, it will update the D word that's in that location, and it will also write that D word out to memory. And so if you have a hit in the cache, so that, that memory line has already been pulled into the cache, it will update it and set the appropriate valid bit to say, hey, I've updated that D word value. And so that, that's a pretty simple behavior. If it doesn't find it in the cache, if either the tag is different or it is marked as invalid in the particular valid bit, it just says, well, okay, so it's invalid in the cache. I'm going to write it to the outside world, and we're not going to we're not going to change the cache's behavior. And it, it's a it's a logical way to do it that you don't you don't necessarily want to go change the cache if it isn't already in the cache. And so it's a good default operating mode, but it does have one very peculiar problem. And this actually starts with I think the weirdest thing of all about the 68030, which is that in a lot of CPUs, you have sort of the CPU itself. And typically you'll have something like an MMU, which is the memory management unit that does the, what you might want to call logical to physical address translation. And oftentimes the cache is the next thing. And then there's the main memory. And the caching is done on the physical address side. 
So when you go to the cache, you're giving it physical addresses that correspond to real addresses from memory. And that's what it uses for, you know, what the tag is and for how it finds things. But the 6030 is interesting. It has the CPU and the cache is basically before the MMU. It's, it's, it's in some ways more in parallel with it, but from a logical point of view, it is before the MMU and before main memory. And the result is that the cache is using logical addresses because they get translated here in the MMU, logical to physical. And so everything in the cache, the address used is the logical address, not the physical address. And the, the reason that's important is because with an MMU, you can have two logical addresses, logical address A and logical address B, and they can be different logical addresses. You can have both of those point to the same physical address, and we'll call this physical address C. So you can have two different logical addresses that map to the same physical address. And here's where you kind of run into the problem, which is that in the normal non right allocate mode, if let's say that logical address B is in the cache and it's valid and all happy as can be, when, if you're in non right allocate, when it goes and looks, it's gonna find the tag for A is different. So it's gonna think, well, it's not in the cache. I'm just gonna write to physical memory. So it'll change the physical memory down here. It'll put a new value in physical memory, but it won't update the cache entry because it was there's a different cache entry there. And in the default mode, it won't um, put it back in the cache, which then the problem is that if you then go later on and read logical address B, which maps to the same physical address, it's gonna have the old value here. Even though you've put a new one into the physical one, it doesn't know that because those two addresses are different logical addresses. And so the advantage is in write allocate mode, it changes the right behavior. Now, if you get a miss, so if the tag is different, so it's not the line that you want it to be, it will change the tag, invalidate all of the entries and put the new D word back in there validated. So effectively it will overwrite the line that, this, that the memory location should have been in. And the reason that works is a somewhat novel and kind of maybe a little non-obvious thing, which is that uh, the size of the cache is 256 bytes. And it turns out in the MMU over here, the minimum size of a page is also 256 bytes. And the reason that's important is because it means that if you have two logical addresses that map to one physical address, because the page size is the same size or a multiple of this cache size, these two logical addresses will always map to the same cache line. And so you're guaranteed that if you have write allocate turned on and you write to logical address A, you're guaranteed to invalidate whatever is in the cache at the line where B would have been. So you're guaranteed that B will always get invalidated. And there could be a, there could be a C as well, not a C, but a D, let's say, another logical address mapped to the same. But all of these would always map to the same cache line because of the cache size and the page size being a multiple of that. And so it's a novel trick such that just by doing this right allocate procedure where when you write, if you get a miss, you're gonna force it to hit by replacing the tag and invalid and you know putting the new line in it guarantees you will never have a case where a different logical to physical mapping condition will give you old data and so the data sheet mentions this that you generally want to turn on this right allocate flag if you're running an operating system where you could have more than one virtual address match to the physical address and i believe that in the i think the amiga os for instance requires that right allocate be turned on and i suspect that many other operating systems would as well because there are numerous cases where you might have more than one logical to physical mapping that's to the same physical page. So it's kind of an, a neat thing, um, you know, performance wise, there could be a case where you can get higher performance with write allocate turned off, especially if maybe you're doing something where you're writing to something uh, and then reading something that would overlap with that and you want the reads to always be faster. So there could be some use cases there where you might optimally turn it off. But in general, you have to leave it on if the operating system needs it because context switches could break that. And that leads to one more kind of odd thing. So because the cache is based off logical addresses, 
it generally means that if you have like more than one process running, usually each process is going to have its own MMU tables for its own virtual or logical to physical mappings will be different between the two processes. And what that means is that whenever you do a context switch, so if you switch from one process to another, you always have to clear both of the caches. It's easy to do. There's a bit field to you can flip to clear the caches or to invalidate them. Uh, but it does mean that on every context switch, you have to clear the caches. Now, this is a pretty small cache anyway, so it's unlikely that on a, on a context switch, you would have very many cases where what's in the cache would be valuable anyways, even if, if there are physical addresses, given they're so small. Uh, but nonetheless, this does require you to always invalidate the cache whenever you do a context switch or anytime you change the uh, logical to physical mapping. So it's kind of a bit of a quirk of the 60 or 30 that's kind of interesting. Um, as far as the outside design, so what we have to think about in designing our CPU, the only real consequence of this is that the if you have an external device, memory, whatever it is, that the CPU thinks is cacheable, the CPU will always, when it reads, it'll always read 32 bits. It'll always read a D word. Even if you execute an instruction, let's say you execute a instruction to read a byte from a given location, and that memory location is cacheable, the CPU will automatically always do a 32-bit read from that device. Even if it's an 8-bit device, by the way, it'll just get converted into four reads in a row of the four bytes that make up that D word. And the reason is because the cache only works in terms of D words. So if you have a byte out here and you want that byte to go through the cache and to stay here, it only works if you actually get the entire D word that contains that byte and then put the D word in the cache. So because the cache only works in D word quantities, there's only a valid bit for each D word, um, all of the cacheable reads will always be 32 bits. It's a minor thing and you'll see it when we're working on our logic that we detect, hey, if it's a read and it's a cacheable area, it's always going to be a 32-bit read. So always turn on all four of the DRAMs or SRAMs or whatever the device is. Um, this doesn't affect devices because for IO devices, you'll mark them as non-cacheable. And if they're non-cacheable, then the CPU doesn't even do the cache at all. So it doesn't require that whole everything is, is a 32-bit read. Um, and so with that in mind, it's overall the cache performance will be a huge difference compared to having no cache. Having a data cache, even a small one like this, uh, can be very advantageous. Um, and most of all, I think anyone who had been developing games on a 60 or 30 would be probably pretty intimately aware of this architecture because you know, if you example, if you're copying from one array or copying maybe from two arrays, doing some math and creating a third array, you would have an advantage if you make sure that all three of these arrays are not, not exactly on 256 byte or powers of that or, or multiples of that uh, offsets. So sometimes you, you may even want to have them so they're offset by a particularly different number to make that copy go faster. And so anyone experienced in O30 code would probably already know this, um, but there is some room for some really cool optimization to tweak the most power out of the 68030. And so with that in mind, that's all we're going to do for this video is describe the caching. In the next video, we're going to talk about how we're going to do our logic, a little bit about CPLDs and FPGAs and kind of get the framework and the groundwork laid for starting on the circuit design. That's it for today.